Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. We're glad that you're here. We have a good group here tonight. That's why I took a, a shot. I can put that in at the beginning of the final edit before I upload it to class to show uh, how many were here. And I've been doing that. If you go check any of them at the YouTube channel, Kiss the Sun YouTube channel, um, you'll, uh, it's kind of neat. Now we have the, as I mentioned last time, there's a camera in the back. There's a camera here. And then, of course, I switched to the full view of, the, of, of this recording of what you're seeing on the screen. And so trying to make it better uh, quality, kind of more professional looking and such. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm able to pick up, I'm trying to use a different mic, but I've been able to pick up some of the comments, some of the wisecracks and the things you say under your breath. And <laughs> yeah, see? Yeah, and then where I can, where I can sort of mute where, I, where you hear me and, and raise it where you hear someone talking out in the room there. So, all right. And I'm going to mention it's... Uh, June 1st, right? Wednesday, June 1st. But we're excited because after we leave here and go home, um, the grands are coming to see us. So I thought I'd give you your little happiness for our icebreaker for class today. They're on the way. That was, I think, from Easter, maybe just from a few weeks ago, recent picture. But they did this one with, um, with a portrait that someone did of Jesus holding Everett, the baby um, that they lost, our, our little grandbaby. And uh, I thought that came out really sweet. And so anytime we can work in, those of you with grandkids know, anytime you can work in anything about your grandkids, you do. I used to roll my eyes at those people, and now I am that guy who does that. So we want to remember, Anna's going in tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, she's having some hardware put in. She's having a filter, right, put in to help with your AFib. And then hopefully you can get off the blood thinners that have these side effects and such, right? And we don't, because you pray right before you come up here in the devotional downstairs, we don't usually have a prayer on Wednesday night when I go into class. But let's say a quick prayer for Anna's sake as, uh, as we begin. Holy Father, we love you, Lord, and we praise your name, and we re rejoice in your presence, and thank you for the privilege of being your children and having the opportunity to be together and open your word and, and study it together. Open our hearts to receive it, Father, and we pray that you would work in us through it to conform us to the image of your Son, that we might be to the praise of the glory of your grace. And at this time, we ask a special blessing for our sister Anna, that all will go well with her procedure and that you bless those taking care of her, give her the very best of care, comfort her and grant her peace and healing. Father, may your hand be on her and John and the family, the whole family. Lord, And we know we have so many in our midst who are dealing with heavy burdens and, and struggles with their health and other issues. Father, And we know that you're mindful of each one and that you look down upon us in your mercy and that you will bless us as you see that we have need. And so we... We give you thanks that we can make intercession for one another and ask for your blessings now for our sister Anna and for all of us and for our teachers. Thank you for the good work they're doing tonight with our children in their classes. May you be glorified now and forever in all things we pray in Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, so Antioch. Antioch last time. Very important center for the spread of the gospel and Barnabas, now we're introduced to Barnabas again because the church in Jerusalem sent Barnabas to Antioch as now we have the establishment of the first Gentile church and all of that. So I want to just jump back into this here, but, but wanted to add at the very, very end of class, as, as after the bell, I think, as class was ending, I just threw in a couple of things that are said here about Barnabas. Verse 23, uh, we already looked at how he saw 
the grace of God and was glad and how he exhorted them, what he exhorted them. But this here, that, um, that he was a good man. I love this, that Luke gives us this rare aside where he pauses to tell us something about Barnabas. And he did this earlier back in Acts chapter 4 about what a generous man that he was. So obviously, Barnabas has made a profound impression on Luke, what Luke has learned about him. And so this is a rare compliment in Scripture for someone in the narrative, to, for, for, for there to be a pause, and for someone in the narrative to be described as a good man. So that's a high compliment. We might throw that around rather loosely. We talk about someone being a good person, but it really is, in scripturally speaking, it is a high compliment. He was a good man. Let's see, um, right in verse 24 it is. He's a good man, and he was full of the Holy Spirit. We said that's the language Luke likes to use uh, a lot. Right And of faith, something similar said back about the six Hellenist uh, believers, Jewish believers back in chap chapter 6 who were appointed, choose men who are full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and, and we're told that they were. I asked you this, though, quickly. I just threw it out there. You remember, he's called a good man. I like to use this text, and really this is something you would discuss when you're looking at in the Gospels and at the case of the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and says, good teacher, what? And depending on which account, I think it's, uh, I think it's Matthew's account, what good thing must I do that I may inherit eternal life? You remember Jesus' puzzling response to him? that is, is a challenge to interpret because he says, good teacher, to Jesus. And Jesus says, why do you call me good? Only one is good, your Father who is in heaven. And we know the Jehovah's Witnesses and those who say they believe the Bible but deny the deity of Christ, they, they pervert that passage to say, see, Jesus didn't claim to be God. He denied that he was God because he said, why are you calling me good when only God is good? And so Jesus was in some way distancing himself from God or denying any claim to deity there. And that's a misunderstanding of that. But how do you reconcile if Jesus said only God is good, then how can Barnabas be called good? And I've listed some other verses like uh, Jesus said himself, right? We know he wasn't speaking in absolute uh, that no one... or he was speaking in the absolute sense, only God is good. But in a relative sense, we can speak of, of people being good because Jesus himself, Matthew 12, 35, said the good man out of the treasure, the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. The good man uh, from the treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And in the, in, the, in the judgment parables in Matthew 25, a couple of times he says, well done, and he uses that adjective, right? good and faithful servant, right? So whenever someone looks at that and says, well, only God is good, I like to come back over here and say, well, but elsewhere in Scripture, we're told Barnabas was a good man. And Jesus uses that description so for men. So obviously, Jesus was speaking in an absolute sense. Only God is truly, ultimately, perfectly good but we can be described as good, as good in, a, in a relative sense, not in the way that God, of course, is uh, perfectly good. Tyler, do you think this is the Holy Spirit saying this, or is this uh, Luke's addition that the Holy Spirit okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, I think, see, we talked about this when we were talking about inspiration and, and, the, uh, and the gospel accounts, um, the synoptics, but... But uh, it's, it's obviously the final product is superintended by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit wanted this said allow, or allowed Luke to say it. But it seems to me there are numerous uh, details that are given that are stylistic that would, would fit Luke and Luke's personality and things that Luke is wanting to say. So the Holy Spirit is making sure he includes what needs to be included and what God wants us to know is being revealed. But the way he says it, I think he allows Luke. I, I think this is Luke 
But of course, he's writing under the influence of the Holy Spirit, so it's approved by the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's an interesting question because I'm always saying, well, Luke says this, or Luke likes to say full of, or filled with, or uh, uh, they're full of amazement, or, or they, were, they marveled and they were amazed and all of that. And you can say, well, isn't the Holy Spirit telling them what to write? Well, then why didn't the Holy Spirit have all the writers say those same things whenever they were writing? Because it's the personality and the interest and the, um, the emotions and the, and the knowledge uh, and the personal life experience of the writer. He's not just a secretary taking dictation, but he is involved in the process of inspiration. So that's why I say that. But, and then notice, too, um, notice he says in verse 26, when, uh, and well, in verse 25, so he went and got Saul. We'll mention that in a minute. Barnabas went to Tarsus. You remember he left Paul up in Cilicia in Tarsus? Uh, in what is lower uh, Turkey along the Mediterranean coast there, modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor. And uh, uh, so he brought him back to Antioch. So, so Paul, Saul, who's going to be called Paul here shortly, he's been gone now for several years, and he's going to come back into the narrative after chapter 12. But Barnabas goes and gets him to see now something exciting is happening. Something monumental is occurring here. There's a whole new base of operations, a church here in Antioch, outside of Jerusalem. There's a thriving Gentile congregation here. This is something significant, and he wants to bring Paul in to help with the work. But when he says in this summary statement, he says, so for a whole year, so for a whole year, we're not told all that was going on during that time. So it's interesting, Luke pauses to give us details about certain individuals, certain moments, certain events. But then summary statements passing over these periods. So try to imagine the time going by and all the people that are hearing the word of God and all that the church is doing and experiencing. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And we'll get to this in a moment. Uh, the disciples were called Christians first. But I want you to notice uh, this. When he makes a summary statement, we'll see uh, in a moment about a great, uh, that a great number were added to the Lord. Um, that that's language we're going to see. Luke keeps talking about the great numbers of disciples that are increasing. And he uses the passive, were added, to show, I think, that God is bringing these people in. This is God's work. God is the one orchestrating this. Yes, all of these individuals are involved, but it's God and the Spirit of God working through these people who are bringing together these souls into this new community of believers, the new covenant community, the church. So they were added uh, together. Well, let's continue on. I wanted to note something here um, that... And, and it's, that's back, I'm sorry, I didn't highlight it, but back in verse 24, a great many people were added to the Lord. I passed, uh, passed over that, but that's what I was referring to there in those last comments. But now this is interesting because we tend to just read through the text and maybe don't realize it's not always following a chronological order. Oftentimes it's a topical order where Luke is choosing to say things to, to cover one particular, make one particular emphasis and cover one particular series of events and, and, and group them together, even if they're not necessarily in that order. Because, look at this, I'm going to separate the text, because between verse 24 and verse 25 is what is going to follow here in chapter 12. When we read about Herod persecuting the church and Herod murdering James, one of the apostles, John's brother, uh, all of that we're about to read in chapter 12 actually happens earlier before then um, Barnabas, Paul, um, rather Barnabas goes and gets Saul from Antioch and brings him. And Saul has been in Tarsus, we learn from back in chapter 9, and you read later from what Paul writes in Galatians, for at least several years. So when you're reading through chapter 9 and then you read about Cornelius and, and Peter in chapter 10, and then you get here to chapter 11, in the meantime, Paul is away. He's elsewhere and several years have passed by. So it gives you a, a sense of how much time is passing that, that we sort of lose when you just read straight through 
the narrative. So that gives us a little bit more of a sense of how, uh, how the months and years are passing by here. And it isn't just one thing immediately after another, after another, after another. But I said last time I'd get to this statement here that is well known because for uh, the end of the verse says that in Antioch, it was in Antioch, uh, the disciples were first called Christians. So we know, you notice we said Luke likes to call believers disciples. We usually say, how do we refer to each other? I, I wouldn't say, oh, uh, uh, you know, Richard, I didn't know your brother was a disciple. He would think I'm weird probably if I said that to him. Or uh, may, maybe I'd say a believer. But how do we usually say it if we want to ask someone else if they have a relative who is a Christian? Or someone, uh, uh, or we don't say, oh, well, when did you become a disciple? We just don't use that language, but that's the language Luke mainly uses. Yeah, member. We say member of the church because we're wanting to emphasize in the way we refer to each other our association with the church of Christ, the member of the church. Not a church or some church, but members of our church, the church. <laughs> so we'll say, uh, oh, are you a member of the church? Or when did you become a member of the church? Or I might say, well, when were you converted? Or when were you saved? But, um, but the main term that people generally use for those who believe in Christ in, in our world and historically since this time or uh, not long after this time is Christian. But they weren't always called that. Remember, you go back, it's been over 10 years, and we're coming up on 12 and 14 years since the, that the, the church has been in existence back in Acts 2, and they're not, called, they're not calling themselves that. They're not referring to themselves as fellow Christians. They're brothers, brothers and sisters, saints, Holy one, set apart, Luke will use that language. Disciple is a key term that he often uses. But they were called Christians. And I think the idea is they were called that by other people. And it's the Latinized form of the word, sort of like those who um, were of a particular political sect were called Herodians because of their support of Herod. And so you find that term used in Mark, uh, they were Herodians. And if you were associated with this Christ, this Jesus whom you call Christ, then you're Christians or Christians. But it seems at first that it was likely a term of derision, that it wasn't a term they chose for themselves, but that uh, if it wasn't initially given to them as a, as a, a, a sort of a pejorative it uh, came to be used, it seemed, in a way, in, in a denigrating sort of way. Oh, those Christians. Or, oh, he's one of those Christians. Uh, now, as widely as the term is used in church history and in world history and, and today, it's only found three times in the Bible. And this would make a great uh, Bible trivia question. We should, know, we should know the three places, and I would say you should have them memorized and be able to at least paraphrase them. But we should all be able to tell, I think, um, not that it's anything that crucial to your spiritual growth to memorize and recite and have hidden in your heart or, uh, or helpful as far as teaching goes, but I, I just think it's of interest to know the three times the word Christian is used in the Bible. So here's the first time, only three times, but uh, now without cheating, without looking at your little uh, notes in your study Bible or whatever, um, at least, where are the other two? What books? Do you know that much? Yes, the other one is uh, outside of Acts is in First Peter, and then in Acts 26. And the way that helped, the way that um, I was able to learn these, just a little thing that was interesting to me, was that there is, um, you see, there's a six in each one. I don't know, I do little things like that that help me memorize things. So there's a, a six in each one. Uh, Acts 11, 26, they were called Christians first in Antioch. Acts 26, 28 is where Paul said, well, I think I have it, yeah, um, where Paul is before Agrippa. 
And Agrippa says, in a short time, your Bible might say a little bit differently, do you think with but little persuasion. But in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? He uses that. Now here, where it seems to be a term of derision, um, because Peter says, verse, 1 Peter 4, 15, let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Uh, the ASV, I think, says as a meddler in other men's matters. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. So in other words, don't be ashamed if you're singled out because you wear that name Christian. Don't be ashamed, but you can glorify God in that name. And so it was embraced uh, apparently, at least that I think is a, is a reasonable way to understand how the term may have originally been used and then come to, to be embraced. Uh, but what it's showing you now is we've reached a point where the church is no longer just, it's not this sect of Jews who say they believe in Jesus, but we have Gentiles now independent seemingly of the Jewish community who have now a separate identity. So this is a major point in history, and that's why I think Luke uh, points it out. But it's interesting to me that you hear that term all the time, but it's not the main one you find in Scripture. But uh, let me finish the chapter, and if you have any questions or comments, we'll do that. Well, um, so now the term today I use in both a technical sense where I'm being very specific, but then I also think there's a sense which you can acknowledge it's used in a general way of anybody who believes or claims, b says they believe in Christ and claims to be a Christian. We use the word broadly of, well, they're Christian. Uh, they're, but technically, a true saved person is only someone, is someone, uh, is limited to only those who have done what the Bible says we must do in order to be saved. And there are many, many people, in fact, the vast majority of people who call themselves Christians, who we would argue technically are not Christians, <laughs> actually, biblically, right? I could explain that later if, if we had a guest with us who was rather shocked or outraged at, at that thought. But, um, but it's sort of like the word church. Now, I used to be a real stickler for, I'd tell the kids, we're not going to church, we're going to worship. We don't go to church, we're going to Bible class, we're going to worship. We're not going to the church, we're going to the building. And that's how, I, when I was converted, that's what we always said. I always said, okay, I'll meet you at the building. We never said, okay, I'll meet you at the church. <gasps> the church, no, we're the church. I, it's the building, right? Does anyone, I see Leah, you're, uh, Leah, you're, you're kind of nodding your head, right? So you guys were, uh, and I always raised my kids that way, and the guy who converted me, that's just how he talked. I just picked it up from him. He just always said, uh, oh, well, okay, it's, it's Bible classes at the building at 7. And then he, he would say, well, okay, after worship, we'll go to lunch. We'd, he'd never say after church, because technically, we're the church. However, we realize in a collo colloquial sense, in a popular sense, the word church can does mean, if you look it up in the dictionary, the dictionary tells you how words are commonly used, not how they're used technically in Scripture. And I don't think it's wrong to say, well, we're meeting here today at the church. And, you know, or to say, okay, after church, Don is buying everyone waffle fries at Chick-fil-A. And uh, you say, after church, you know, well, you mean, right, Don's just learning about all this stuff. I singled... What we're, yeah, well, it's, it, and the word actually is assembly, and the etymology of it is the called out, and it's from the Latin that uh, means, I believe, the call, now the Greek, ecclesia, is called out, but then we get our English word, kirk, uh, is from the Gaelic, or, or, or it goes back earlier to that through Latin, I think, to mean the, uh, the, the separated or called out ones. So that's where we get our English word church from the Greek, the called out. But we're the, we're the body of Christ. We're the, we're the body of believers. And it can mean assembly. In fact, in Acts 19, when there's an assembly of all the people, of the, there's a crowd assembled in Exodus in the theater, and Luke calls that an, an ecclesia, a church. And he calls the Israelites in the wilderness the church in the wilderness, the ecclesia in the wilderness in Acts 7. What's that? Stephen did, rather. So. A lot of times in the Old Testament, they talk about the Israelites being the congregation. Or, yeah, it'll, assembly or congregation. 
And in the New Testament, the same Greek word is used in Acts 7. Stephen refers to the church in the wilderness. So, yeah, it's, uh, so in a similar way, Christian is used in both. We, we may use it in a technical sense where we're being very specific about who is actually saved according to Scripture and what we must do to be saved to be properly called a Christian. But I often use it in a general sense the way people do the word church, too. I like that word church because if you leave the you out, it's not a word. Okay, so there's no church without you. So, you, so you're in charge of the church signs around town, right? That people put up like, uh, like there's no I in team. What? Uh, wait, I see some really. Oh, let's see. I saw one in Mechanicsville, the Mechanicsville Church of Christ, which was actually the Christian church. It said, um, "Come check out our Sundays. We have lots of nuts." And it said Sunday. They wanted you to come to worship Sunday. Get it? Sunday. We have lots of nuts. All right, tell you what, next time I'm going to have a bunch of those cheesy church sayings from the church signs. You can Google that. There's all kinds of them. So, uh, How about the word disciples during that time? Was the word disciples used for uh, a bunch of other groups? These were yeah, the disciples of Christ? Yeah, the disciple is a follower, a learner, and someone who imitates his master. And so that's why it came to be adopted. Of, it, but it was already, yes, in use. It wasn't d just exclusively a Christian term. Right, right. So, um, all right, well, uh, yeah, so that'll be fun. We'll look at some funny church signs next time. And some of them are, are quite witty and clever. And I've seen some that are borderline blasphemous. I won't put those up, I guess. Um, the church of Christ meets here in the Yeah, instead of, instead of saying the church... The Church of Christ, like, like, so when people drive by, they see this building and they say, that's the Church of Christ. They'll say, the Church of Christ meets here, right? Um, or I, I remember I changed the station area to church where I was. The bulletin, instead of Kensington Woods Church of Christ, I put the Church of Christ at Kensington Woods. Like, we're the church and we just, we're in Kensington Woods. But, uh, the elders didn't like that, so I changed it back. So, uh, but we're the Church of Christ in League City, right? Well, we don't have authority to make the title. Well, yeah, we. I do think we have authority to name ourselves. Technically, we legally we have to have some kind of name in order to own property and such. We have to have a legal designation. But, but I, I do think there's biblical authority. But I know technically those aren't names in Scripture. They're designations, right? They're they're ways of referring to the church but they're not proper names, per se, like we would use them. Uh, wow, okay, I gotta get, wait, let me, let's, let, let me go through this. So, in, the, in these days, verse 27, now in these days, prophets came down. Remember when we started the book back in 2014, whenever it was, it's been years ago now, I lose track of time, it's all so disorienting. But uh, we talked about one of the challenges in studying Acts is what things are normative and intended to be a part of the pattern that God is giving for the church, for us to practice today for all time, and what elements were unique to this apostolic period in the early Christianity that were not intended to be a permanent part of the church. Because notice what we've got mentioned here. We've got prophets mentioned, and we've got elders mentioned. Why do we have elders? And we say, because they're right there in the Bible, but we don't have prophets in our church. So we, people would say, you're not a true New Testament church like our church is. We have prophets like you read in the Bible, like the church had in the Bible. Now, I've had people say that to us before. How do you answer that? Well, let me, uh, let's just explain here. Uh, we learn, uh, going all the way to back to Acts chapter 2, that this was going to be a part of the way God revealed His will in the New Covenant age when it was inaugurated, when it burst through, and, uh, and when the Spirit came forth, that the prophecy of Joel, God was going to pour out His Spirit on all flesh, and your young men will uh, prophesy and see visions and dream dreams. And, your women, and He mentions the uh, women as well. And so we have numerous references in Acts to prophets, including female prophets. Philip had four unmarried daughters, we learn in chapter 21. And all four of them were prophets. All four of them. And so 1 Corinthians 12 talks about God set some in the church to be prophets. We had apostles, we had prophets. And uh, he talks about the gift of prophecy. And that, that, when we hear prophecy, we often think of that means like predicting the future. 
but generally is simply to speak forth or speak on behalf of another, to speak for God. And it could involve predicting, but generally it involved speaking, revealing God's will, and exhorting people like the, prof the Old Testament prophets. They'd speak the will of God to the people. They'd speak the word of God to the people and exhort the people to be obedient to it, to encourage. That's what we're going to see later in chapter 15. Um, but here's the short answer, right? We know that in the absence of the fully revealed and completed and written recorded Word of God, the only way to hear the Word of God, right, was if someone spoke it. So early on, the Word of God was revealed through the Holy Spirit on the apostles and prophets. And I should have put Ephesians 3, 3 through 5 up here, where Paul talks about the, uh, the message that has been revealed through the apostles and prophets in Ephesians chapter 3, right? Not, not just the apostles, because we often say we follow the apostolic pattern, right? Well, they had authority as the ambassadors of Christ. They had authority to bind on the church the, the will of God. The, um, but prophets were also revealing the word of God. Prophets wrote part of the New Testament. Not all the New Testament writers were prophets. Give me a writer of a New Testament book that was not, or rather not, they were not all apostles. Give me a writer who was not an apostle. Luke himself, right? Writing this text and Mark. So, uh, you, and you, uh, so the Word of God is being revealed orally through men, and then it's coming to be recorded and written down. James, likely the first letter of the New Testament that was written here, not around this particular time, actually. And then it begins to be recorded, and then once it is fully revealed and recorded and collected, then that is how God's will is revealed and known. And there's no longer a need to have people who are directly inspired of the Holy Spirit to stand up and speak the word of God today. But if the church is assembling in Antioch, uh, Barnabas can't get up and say, well, turn it in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. It ha hadn't been written yet, right? And he can't uh, tell them, turn to, your, to, to 2 Samuel. They don't even have all their own copies of the Hebrew Bible. But men could get up and reveal the will of God and speak the will of God. So inspiration was in men, and it overlaps at the period where it's in writing until eventually it's fully in writing, and then it's no longer in men, and now it's in, the, in this book. But there are people who will argue today. In fact, I've had a study with someone this week who her relative is trying to get her to go to a church where they believe they're the true church because their pastor over that church is an apostle. And I actually saw a YouTube video of him praying, leading the church in prayer, where he was telling God to make sure all the people knew they were supposed to listen to him as his apostle and obey him. It's right here in Houston. So people think you read about apostles and prophets in the Bible, so we must have them today. They're failing to discern properly the, the unique elements of this early period that were necessary like scaffolding until the structure is built and then are taken away and are no longer a part of the, the church. We do not have apostles and prophets in the church today. The word prophesy, I would the say. words in the original language the same for the word prophets and uh, uh, when the word prophesied is used? The verb form for, now the noun is prophecy it's funny you people don't know that I heard uh, in an episode of 30 Rock one time, uh, Lemon was reading for, who's that actress from, that played her, does anyone know? Uh, no, 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 wow. Now that's going back about 40 years, 40 years earlier. <laughs> but, uh, oh, I know you guys know her. But uh, she was reading at a wedding in a scene from 1 Corinthians 13, and she says, whether there be prophesy it will cease, right? And she didn't know it was prophecy, right? That it's pronounced differently if it's the noun versus the verb, right? I, I prophesy a prophecy, uh, but, but a prophet is, uh, is the noun, prophecy is a noun, prophesy is the verb, and uh, I think they're all from the same root, yes. So, so I'd right, have to check, though. Anyone who prophesied in the New Testament could also be called a prophet, right? Yeah, but I suppose prophets were those who were known to continue to do it. But Agabus, well, we're told Agabus was a prophet, and, and then 
he's, we're given one time when we read of a revelation he gave, but then he, it says he, he was a prophet. So, um, so I don't know of any cases where it would be an isolated thing, but, it's, but I think that's entirely possible uh, that, that someone could speak a prophecy and not be actually a, a, someone who was, ha had the ongoing gift of prophecy that we read about in the early church. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. This light, you're right behind. It's Molly, right? No, no, that's your sister's name. Tell me your name again. Macy. Macy. Her sister is marrying Kim's nephew in how long? Uh, Soon. In about a month. In about a month. So, and, but she's here with us now while she's doing an internship at NASA. I'm sorry, I got your name confused. But you're right behind this light, so I have trouble. I have a glare in my face. I was going to ask, correct me if I'm wrong, but is it? You're wrong. It's wrong. <laughs> Are you contradicting me? You're wrong. No. Isn't there a place where it talks about the fact that the, when the apostles laid hands on someone to receive spiritual gifts, those people had the spiritual gifts, but they couldn't pass it on? In the yes, way? yes. So the way I've had it explained to me is that naturally, since those people couldn't pass it on, once that generation of people right. out, then the spiritual gifts were no longer... Passed. Right. The apostles would lay hands. We talked about that back in Acts chapter 8. They sent Peter and John down to, 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 to Samaria. And then uh, we'll see later in Acts 19, it's very clear that these gifts, and then from two statements, when Paul writes to Timothy, he mentions the gift that is in you through the laying on of my hands, right? So we have several times when we learn miraculous powers were given through the laying on of the apostles' hands. And uh, I think sometimes it came directly, like in Acts 2, momentarily, like you were saying, a, a one-time occasion, like Cornelius and his households. I don't think they were all prophets, but they were all speaking in other languages uh, when the Holy Spirit came upon them. So there's, a, there's maybe an example of an isolated case of being empowered by the Spirit to reveal and speak. You mean in Acts 19, you said they prophesied when they... Right. They, okay, that would also be a, then a good example of a one-time occurrence. But to receive the gift of prophecy, right, that I believe you would have the apostles would lay hands on people and they would receive it. And since there are no apostles, but see, and then you'd have to show there aren't apostles. How, would, how do you show there aren't apostles today? Because then we would argue since there are no apostles today, then no one has those miraculous gifts. But how do we show there are no apostles today? Right. You had to, to qualify to be an apostle, you had to be an eyewitness of the resurrection of Christ. So that, no one is qualified for that today. There were only 12 originally, and Judas, when he hanged himself, there was someone selected to replace him. And uh, later, uh, the word apostle does seem to be extended to one other individual. We'll talk about later in Acts. But it's a select individual. Jesus tells them, you're going to sit on 12 thrones, ju judging the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. That imagery is constant of the 12, the 12, the 12. And... I would say one of the one of the clearest arguments is that they were um, simply a part of the early uh, history of the church, in, and there were they were not intended to continue. That office was not intended to continue in perpetuity throughout the church age. That they don't have successors is that in order to prove you are an apostle, Paul talks about in Second Corinthians twelve. He did the signs of an apostle, right? You, you don't believe someone who claims to be an apostle and speak for the Lord without evidence, right? When God gives revelation, he gives confirmation to accompany that revelation so you know the person speaking. It does have authority that he is speaking by the Spirit of God, and no one can do the signs of the apostles today. And, of course, in the Roman Catholic Church, they claim the Pope is the chief apostle, the successor of Peter, the chief apostle of, over all the church, and in order to qualify to be appointed to the papacy to be pope, you have to have some kind of proof, they claim, that you've performed at least two miracles because to prove that you would qualify to be an apostle. But no, there is no evidence that anyone is performing the signs of an apostle today. So I would say the burden of proof is on someone who claims to be apostles or churches who say, we're an apostolic church, we have apostles. Where are the signs that prove? And if they are not present, then there is no evidence that you are an apostle. And Jesus commends the church, by the way, in Revelation, the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2. He commends those who call themselves apostles 
and are not. They were false apostles, right? Second Peter one, Second Peter two, one and following talks about false apostles and prophets. Sorry, I'll take a breath. I think the second part of that, where the apostles would lay hands, but those people couldn't pass it. Right. Oh, that that's the other thing you said. Right. Right. They couldn't con pass it on, right? Simon the, Simon the magician is wanting to buy that apostolic power to pass it along. Um, right. See now, Peter, and he says, uh, "Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit.'" Right. And I guess that implies that most of the other people couldn't pass. It along. No, it, and and the fact that they had to get Peter and John to come down. Philip had hands laid on him back in chapter 6. And Philip was able to do signs, but he could not pass the Spirit on. James and John, two apostles, had to come and directly lay hands on. And Simon, the text does say, Simon saw it, it was through the laying on of the apostles' hands. And I think it came up when we looked at that text a while back that what Simon wanted was not the Holy Spirit. He wanted the power to pass on. He wanted the ability to give the power of the Holy Spirit uh, to people, and that was something only the apostles had. Right. So, uh, Rachel, you had your hand up. Do you still remember? Um, yeah, I was just wondering how um, the people that claim to be apostles, how do they address the scripture that talks about the qualifications of well, the resurrection? Um, I don't know how the Roman Catholic Church deals with that um, because I don't believe they claim the, the popes have been eyewitnesses of the resurrection unless they claim the Lord has appeared to them. Um, so off the cuff, without knowing for sure, if, if I was trying to answer that, I guess I'd say, well, that was a qualification to be one of the original 12 you had to be an eyewitness of the resurrection, but their successors didn't have to be because their successors came along after Jesus was already raised and ascended back to heaven. That was a clear qualification for him. Right, to, to be one of the original 12. But then they might say, but, but their successors, the qualifications are different. But, but see, that's just an assertion. That's not Bible proof, but I guess that's what they'd say. But I know, like that church I was telling you about, I saw a YouTube video of a preacher uh, at, at, at this church in Houston because this woman was being pulled into it. It's very controlling. It's very cultish. And she had relatives trying to get her to attend there. And I was trying to teach her the gospel and convert her. And so she had me watch that video. And the way he got around that was he claimed Jesus came to him and appeared to him in a vision like he did to Paul on his hospital bed and uh, that he, he experienced the miracle of healing and he saw the Lord so that so he was an eyewitness of the Lord the resurrected Lord and then he you know then he claimed to be able to have miraculous power and the miracle he did was something somebody nobody saw that was off somewhere else that he was just claiming just bald assertion and people will accept that and believe whatever he tells them that's why first John 4 1 this is why I kept emphasizing to that woman and along with the text in Revelation where it says, you, I, I, he commended the church at Ephesus, I think it's Revelation 2, too, because you tried those who called themselves apostles and uh, are not, and found them to be false. They were false apostles but, apostles. but the other one, 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, for there are many false prophets who've gone out into the world. Just because someone says they have the gift of prophecy and they're speaking for God, they can be a false prophet just because someone's making the claim. Now, how do you test whether someone is a true prophet or not then? Test the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. How do you t against what do you test a person who claims to be speaking for God? Right. Against the revelation we have from the apostles and prophets that we know came from God, right? If I just held this up and it was blank, it wouldn't be as impressive, so I'm going to pull the text up. But you check it against the the text of scripture, right? that we know came from the apostles and prophets, and those who claim to be speaking as prophets today contradict 
what we know the true prophets of God revealed and is recorded in Scripture. But now that's different from elders. So let, I mentioned Agabus here. Notice verse 28. One of them named Agabus stood up and foretold. So prophecy often did involve foretelling the future, but that's not the bulk of biblical prophecy, uh, really. So he foretold by the Spirit there would be a great famine over all the world, and this took place in the days of Claudius. So he says, now notice he said they're being called Christians, but Luke's still calling them disciples. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Now, uh, here we're going to see from this point forward how prominent the elders become in the narrative as we move from the apostles being sort of the shepherds and having authority over the church to everything is done in connection with elders. Now, how do we know elders are different? How do we know elders are not like apostles and prophets, that it isn't something you're just reading about in Acts that was unique to, the, to this period, but that God wants to continue in all churches down through the... Because that's one of the distinctive things about the churches of Christ is we have, we insist on elders. I'm not a pastor or a shepherd over this church. We have men appointed who are elders. How do you know we still are to have elders today, but not apostles and prophets? You know, later Paul tells Timothy years later that there's something that is necessary for you to do in these churches you're working with. You need to go and appoint elders in every church. He tells Titus, Titus 1.5, 1 Timothy 3. He tells them that uh, these, this, is, this is something that becomes obvious that this is an office in the church that is to be a part of the government and organization of the church. What's beautiful about this collection, I know the bell rang, so I like to just throw all this in so I can say, yeah, look, we got to the end of the chapter. But this collection... Uh, they each gave of their own free will, each one according to his ability. When they sent it, they sent it to the elders. It was sent to the brothers there. Notice he calls them the disciples and brothers, showing their relationship as family. Some in the church have argued you can only send benevolent aid to other saints. That's called the saints only doctrine. Is anyone familiar with it? Has it ever troubled the church in this area? The saints only view of church benevolence? Um, and uh, what's beautiful about it is here you have a Gentile church. Non-institutional that. Right. That's the non-institutional or, or the anti-movement as it's often called. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. But, um, but here you had Gentile believers hearing about Jews in Jerusalem who needed aid. And Paul, this isn't the collection Paul talks about in his letters that he took up when he went out later preaching among the Gentile churches to bring to the needy saints in Jerusalem. But just like the collection Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, 1 Corinthians 16, and, and in Romans 15, it went a long way of bringing Jew and Gentile together. That social barrier, that distance, that tension between Jew and Gentile coming together in the church, loving each other and taking care of each other and ministering to each other has a powerful effect in showing the, the fellowship and the mutual acceptance that we have together in Christ. Very powerful when we help take care of each other. That's a very powerful way that God did it then and uh, that, that we continue to manifest that kind of love and acceptance. So, all right, I'll just keep talking. You guys are free to leave. Uh, no, we're glad that you're here. You know, I had all these pictures of Herod and the beheading of James to get to and all that. So. Make sure to come back. We're going to get James murdered next time. And Peter released from prison. All right. God bless.